Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. Police have released a statement regarding the missing persons case of Rob Ramsey, host of the hit show Pub Crawl. Mr. Ramsey was last seen scouting locations in Derry for an upcoming season of Pub Crawl. He was last seen asking, as one citizen stated, too many questions regarding the town's past and was directed towards Juniper Hill. Hopefully, the people there were less cutthroat and sent him on his way. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And joining us via Zoom, Canadian actor, writer, and producer from New Brunswick, best known for his role as Donnie on Spike TV's Blue Mountain State. Our listeners may know him from his appearance in It Chapter 2, the lead in the Dollar Baby Popsy, and host of Pub Crawl. Please welcome to the show, Rob Ramsey. Rob, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's a pleasure. I'm a a fan. I'm a genuine fan. Thank you. This is the first time we've had it, because you're not necessarily a repeat but we did we talked to to john Mann who crea who did popsy and now we're talking to you so this is like cool to get another level of that discussion yeah i uh, i was able to listen to his episode and um yeah hopefully i can i don't know shine a light on the other side of it from the, <laughs> from the actor side of things sounds good man well before we get into the interview i'm going to turn things over to cm who guards the interview with her life so I, I really hope you're prepared. I, I, yeah, I am. Awesome. All right. Josh likes to make it sound dramatic, and it is very dramatic, because if you fail these questions, <laughs> I have a dress form upstairs named Veronica, and you might find her waiting in your room one night. <laughs> 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 Our audience will get that someday. <laughs> Watch Missy. The audience okay. is laughing. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just terrified. <laughs> So my first question is, what was your introduction to Stephen King's work? I don't know if this is like, if you guys like frown upon this, but I found Stephen King through movies as opposed to his novels. So I remember being younger and at a cottage and someone threw on Misery, the James Caan and uh, Kathy Bates movie. And I, I was like, what in hell is this? This is terrifying. And, and I remember being blown away by the acting especially Kathy Bates. So that was definitely my, my intro to Stephen King, his uh, screenwriting, shall we say. We do not frown on that at all. And Misery is one of my favorite adaptations. So I, Veronica is going to be disappointed. She has to stay <laughs> here. <laughs> stay in your room, Veronica. <laughs> one final question before we move on to other things. Do you have a, a Stephen King moment from any of his work that has just stuck with you over the years? Um, I'm going to stay in the movie world, and I know it was just a short story, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Shawshank in, uh, mm-hmm. in one of these two questions, and there's so <laughs> many great moments, but uh, the one that sticks out to me when they realize that he's escaped prison and the warden throws the chess piece that he's made at the poster, and then you just hear the like, ding, ding, and there's that really cool shot from inside the tunnel where you see him peering through the hole he's made. That one always stuck with me. I remember that was one of my first, like, what the hell moments <laughs> where I was like, no way, that was cool. That one will always stick with me. Yeah, we covered that on the show. And that was, I think that was one of the first movie adaptations I saw where I was like, oh, these can be really good. <laughs> Not to disparage the other ones. They have their their charms about them, but... Yeah. I, I, and you know what? I'll give you another one. I'll stick with Shawshank. When they're, strictly from an acting point of view, when they're sitting on the... Um, or that whole scene when they're tarring the roof mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. Andy Dufresne tells the sergeant or, or whatever it is, um, uh, do you trust your wife? That whole, that whole yeah. section, like where he has them over the ledge, and then it cuts to them just sitting beers, like they're sipping beers, like they're normal. On, on <laughs> oh my god! I gotta, we gotta end this. I gotta go rewatch Shawshank. <laughs> well, it was great talking to yeah, you. Right. Enjoy <laughs> the movie. <laughs> and Veronica, my way. <laughs> 
So does he pass? I, get, I, oh yeah, you already said it. Never yeah, mind. he passed. He <laughs> mentioned misery. That's like the secret yeah. key. If you could have said literally <laughs> anything else after that, I'd been like, "Good job, you pass." <laughs> have you read either Misery or Shawshank? Have you had a chance to read either of them? I think I read Shawshank. I don't think I've read yeah. Misery. Misery is equally as good as the movie mm-hmm. and substantially more violent. So it, highly recommend it. One of the things I've always loved about Stephen King. Uh, well, obviously so many things, but that's so hard to like, to make something scary on paper mm. is so hard, especially nowadays. And and so many of those older scary or horror books, I guess we'll call them, don't hold up now. Cause I just think we've been so, I don't know, we've been painted and, and we have, we have all like, we've seen and heard so many things that we're like, eh, that's not so bad. <laughs> you know, um, when you read, like, even when you go back and read old Stephen King stuff, you're just like sweating. And that so that is where our Stephen King moment thing really came from because we so Josh had I, I ruined this for Josh and I feel so bad for me Stephen King moment was when I read Room fourteen oh eight and the way that he describes the door to the hotel room terrified me and I had to sleep with a light on and I was in my mid twenties so I wasn't <laughs> even a kid it's slightly embarrassing but I I remember being blown away that a book could do that because that was when I was. I was still exploring Stephen King and I had not, I had not experienced horror on paper that could build tension so well. And that kind of skill really holds up on paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're so right. Well, now you, we talked about earlier that we, we wanted to talk to you, Rob, for a a bit of an actor's perspective, because it's what we've seen you do the most uh, as we've been exposed to you what is that process like for you seeing something on the page that you're like, I have to amp this up and make it scary. Like, how do you bring that to life? Do you have like a a technique that you lean on? I don't think you ever look at something and go, how can I make that scary? I think at the end of the day, you just want to make things as honest and truthful for yourself as you can. And if you can really do that and it's good writing and there's good directing, I think that the fright will come through. And, you know, there's there's variations of that. Like, I think something we'll talk about later is Popsy, and that wasn't necessarily something I could make as honest and truthful as I could <laughs> and find within me. But um, but you can you can find variations of that. So, yeah, I, I think the more honest and truthful the, the performance is, then the scarier it really will be. So when did you realize that acting wasn't just something you wanted to do for fun, but it was something you wanted to really get into? I, when I was younger, did some community theater. I sort of backed my way into it. And I was in <laughs> production of Anna Green Gables. And uh, I, I don't know if you guys are sure. Have you guys heard of Anna Green Gables? Oh, yeah. I was a community theater person as well. <laughs> Every community theater has done Anna Green Gables. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for those that don't know, no, it's set in uh, Prince Edward Island, which is a... a small province in Canada, in the Maritimes, about this uh, precocious young redhead and the shenanigans she gets into. And uh, I played a small role, uh, Moody McPherson, and there was one part in it where I'm eating prunes in the back of the class, as you do, or I guess as you did in like (laughs) 1890 or whenever whenever it was. And the teacher yells at me and says, Moody McPherson, come up here. And he puts his hand out and he goes, spit it out. And I remember having to actually spit out my prune into the teacher's mouth. And every (laughs) night, laugh and everyone lost it because I really did have a prune in my mouth and I would spit it into this other actor's hand. And I think that was that was definitely a a turning point for me. Getting that laugh every night just Mm -hmm. by doing so simple, something so simple. I was like, oh, wow, this I hate to sound like a douche, but I was like, this fills my soul. I feel Mm -hmm. great. This, if I could do this for the rest of my life, that would be a win. I would never work a day in my life. (laughs) And so that was, that definitely kicked things off for me. I ended up doing more community theater because of that. And then eventually I went to school for acting and then university for acting and then got an agent. And you can make an argument that prunes started my career. (laughs) That's the most excitement prunes have ever had. (laughs) I, as somebody who did community theater as well, uh, do you still ever go back to community theater? Or is your schedule just too jam packed? Well, I think I can like contractually I can't. Oh, uh, sure, because it's it's all non union stuff. Yeah, um, but I still see a fair amount of it. I, I tried pre COVID PC 
I, uh, <laughs> I used to just see as much as I could. I would intake as much as I could, uh, whether it was movies or, or theater or concerts. I would try to see as much as I could. And so I would, I would see a lot of community theater, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm, as I'm sure you know, it's not all good. <laughs> all. There's, a, there's a performance or a show that really speaks to you and, and stands out and sort of makes it all worthwhile. Do you miss that instant gratification, though? Moving yeah, to I'd film and stuff? back in a theater. I really would. I just haven't had an opportunity. I don't know. I, w- I would love to do it, though. I, I got to a point a few years ago, well, more than that, like 10 years ago, when I realized I actually love being nervous uh, <laughs> and scared. That, like, that terror you feel when you're about to step on stage or, or when you are on stage and you have a moment where you start to blank and you're like, oh, God, oh, God, I don't remember what my next line is. And then just at the last second, it comes to you. It's like, the only thing I can relate it to is like when you're driving on a highway and some highways have that rumble strip. And you're, <laughs> like, you're off in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden you hit that rumble strip and you're like, oh God, oh God, oh God. I've realized that I love, <laughs> you can love that moment. And, and, you know, I get that sometimes when I'm going into an audition and anytime I get that feeling when I'm going into an audition, I'm always like, oh, this is good. I'm going to do well because I care about it. If, if I am, if I have these feelings, it means I really care about it. So that's awesome. I forgot the question. Yeah, I missed the fear. <laughs> immediate gratification. I am. I really miss that, yeah. like immediate that response and that uh, and that that feeling of like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> another night, another crowd. Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We discovered your uh, incredible acting ability through Popsy, but it wasn't until uh, after talking to you that I realized I had seen you plenty beforehand because I caught you on Blue Mountain State years ago. And when you, I, I got your, uh, looked into you and I was like, oh my God, that's Donnie. All right, that's, that's crazy. Uh, and, and I just, I had to ask because uh, the show was one of the horniest things I've ever seen on TV. And... It was so loved that you guys managed to raise money for a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I've got to ask, what was the experience like reuniting with everybody, deciding to raise the money to put this together, and then actually getting to do it? It's funny. It's I don't know if that show would be made nowadays. No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there's even times I'm fortunate enough in my life and in my career to get recognized a lot. And I think it's because I'm like a big guy and I'm like 6'4 and I have... A, giant curly like I don't I, I don't blend in I <laughs> but I'm always surprised when like young women come up to me and they're like oh my god we love your show and I'm like really <laughs> <laughs> There's, there was so much misogyny and so sexism. much <laughs> but I will say the one thing I think the show had going for it was that it never apologized for anything and I think so many shows do that nowadays where uh They'll they'll push the boundary and push the limits. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the episode, in the last you know two minutes, it's like, but everything we all learned a lesson. Everything's going to be fine. And our show didn't do that. In fact, it sort of spit in your face in the last two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am really proud of the show in that sense, and, and in many senses. We all the cast got really close. We shot it in uh, Montreal for for a few years, and we all came from away from various places. So we were all sort of living in a hotel, and we all hung out all the time, and it's it's true every once in a while there there's a show that is an anomaly i'm sure you guys have all experienced this where you go to something or you do something at the end of it you're all like we should stay in touch let's hang out yeah and it was one of the few few shows where we all said that and did it awesome and like i still see uh i just saw james Cade who played Harmon a month or two ago i see omari who played larry every so often I see Alan, who played Thad. We're actually very close. I, oh. I, I lived with him in LA for a short what? period of time. And then he, he's been working a lot in Toronto, where I am now. So we all, and he was at my wedding. We're all still very close. So being able to, it's not like we ever really lost touch. And when this opportunity to, uh, to do the movie came around, it was like, oh yeah, no, that just makes sense. That's what we need to do. If people are sort of clamoring for it, then um, we got to do this. And uh, so, yeah, we we did a Kickstarter. I believe at the time we raised the second highest amount for a movie after Veronica Mars. Holy uh, shit. So, yeah, it was like a, cu- a couple million. I, one of the things I didn't realize is that doing a Kickstarter like that is a full-time job. It's a full court press with like a staff of people because you need incentives. You need to be pumping out content all the time to engage people. So 
So it was a lot of work. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time and, uh, and was able to really pitch in and help out and super proud of that. Super, super proud of that. You know, we had producers who did a lot, a lot of heavy lifting, but as, as an actor and a contributor, uh, it, was, it was a blast to be a part of that. And so rewarding when I actually showed up on set and we made the movie, it was like, wow, yeah. we really did this. We really, we sort of skirted the, the Hollywood production route and did it ourselves. We were really proud of that. It's not often you get a, a series that ends and then you really, you get to come back and give it that exclamation point and really send it off. I, know. Uh, I think that's, that's gotta be such an amazing feeling. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And I think a lot of us had, uh, Our writers did a really good job of giving everyone a sort of, oh, that's cool moment for everyone in the show. Mm -hmm. Donnie certainly had one. Donnie came out as gay in in the movie, (laughs) which I thought was so, was so great and so, so interesting. And, uh, and, and a lot of other actors had some moments like that. It was, it was nice to sort of give that one last, like, I'll see you, Donnie. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. A cool little epilogue, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Going over to another project that uh, John actually told us about when we did his interview and it blew our mind. So we had to go back and watch it. You were in it chapter two. You got your throat slit by Henry Bowers. <laughs> for a brief moment. Yeah. Yeah. For a br- brief moment. What was that experience like getting to work on a major Stephen King movie? It was, it was incredible. It was incredible. It was one of those weird situations where you like audition and you don't hear anything for like, I think it was about a part of six months, like six months went by. And oh my God. Yeah, and I was like, Okay, I, I've gotten really good at like investing everything to an audition, and then when it's done, it's like, all right, that's out of my head. <laughs> you don't get it. It's, so I had long forgotten about it, and then when I did find out that I got it, a lot of those big movies have like code names, or or they it doesn't actually say like, oh, you've been cast in it chapter two. And I think this one was called Largo or something like that. <laughs> so my agent was like, yeah, you got cast in Largo, and I was like, great. Cool. And then I put the pieces together and I was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's my chapter two. That's cool. That's great. The other funny thing, this is a funny story. I love Stephen King. I love how he can instill fear in his stories and the characters and the writing and everything. But man, do I hate scary movies. <laughs> I, I don't remember what I saw as a kid. Actually, it might have even been the original It. And I was like, why do people do this? Why do people willingly sit down for two hours and feel scared? I don't get it. So it's never been my thing. And I'll never forget showing up on set. And I didn't have a big part. Like, literally, you blink, I think I'm in it for three minutes or something like that. And so this is pretty ballsy of me, I guess. But I, the director, Andy, uh, Andy Muschietti, was like, so um, uh, you, saw the, you saw the first It? And I was like, oh, uh, no. <laughs> Don't really like scary movies. <laughs> okay, but you're you're gonna see this one, right? Like you're in it, and I was like, <laughs> out, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so, needless to say, I won't be in it chapter three if he's doing it. <laughs> yeah, he he was like, okay, sure, welcome to set. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Have you watched it? Uh, I've seen bits and pieces of it. I still haven't seen it the whole way through. <laughs> Those bits and pieces being your part, I presume. Actually, I don't even know. Oh, I've seen it. Yes, I've seen my, yeah, I have seen my part. How do you not watch yourself die on camera? That's the, be- that's the best payoff to being in a horror movie. Man, dying on camera is so freaking hard. <laughs> so freaking hard. And like, I, as an actor, how do you prepare for it? Like, you go online and you look up videos of people dying? What? <laughs> no, like... I died a few times on camera in different ways. And so you have to like, I remember I almost became like a freaking biologist or a doctor going into like, all right, well, what happens when the throat slits? Like what, what, mm-hmm. what li- like scientifically happens? Okay. Well, the larynx gets split and this opens and that opens and you're like, you're actually just drowning in your own blood. So then, okay, well, that's a, that's a gurgle sound. And so <laughs> you kind of just become a detective of like, what sound? It's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I see someone die on camera, I'm like, oh man, good for them. <laughs> so I do remember that I have seen all of my stuff, and I, but I do think I looked away or turned away when I did. <laughs> what am I doing? Look at this goof trying to die on camera. What a turkey. Oh my God, that's, that's fantastic. I love it. Let's circle back to, to Popsy, because we, we talked about that we interviewed John. You guys have done several short films together. We got a chance to watch uh, a few of those. What is it like 
working on an adaptation versus when you guys, when you and John are just spitballing, deciding the next project and what you're going to do. Yeah. Different. I guess I'll start by saying Popsy was definitely John's baby. I don't know that I know anyone else who lives and breathes Stephen King Mm. like John does. So this was in his head. He had the vision from the get go. And so I think when you're working on an adaptation, you you're working off of something. There's a starting point. And when you're creating something on yourself by yourself, there are no there are no bumper rails, man. There's no like it's like all right, well it can go it can go this way. We can we can go play on the other lane if we. I'm using the weird bowling analogy. <laughs> uh, yeah, there there are no guardrails. There's nothing to say like okay, well you got to. It's an adaptation, so you got to stay in this lane or on mm-hmm. this road. So that that helps in a way, but then it also can be more challenging because like how do you a lot of people have driven down that road before. How do you do that originally? And how do you make it interesting? So there's some challenges there as well. Two totally different approaches. So obviously, like, Popsy was very well done, and we were blown away by that. And John was kind enough to send us additional work that you guys have done together. Missy was, it was so amazing to watch you just basically act against yourself just the whole thing was only you and you brought to life the scenery around you the dress form that really scared the shit out of me like i i have one upstairs i wasn't joking her name is not veronica i just made that up (laughs) but because that would be weird (laughs) yeah that'd be weird but your your interaction with that inanimate object brought it to life in a really cool cool awesome way and I didn't even have a question. I just wanted to gush about that. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. (laughs) What was it like for you to do that as an actor? How were you able to really just pull that off, basically it being you? Well, thank you very much for your kind words. I think I was kind of at a point there where I had been doing a lot of comedy. Like I think I think I Blue Mountain State had finished shortly before that. And so I know John and I really wanted to lean into something more dramatic, a grounded drama. And so this was this was a, a nugget that John had, and we sort of, you know, we put water on it and it grew into to what you saw. And we're really, really, really proud of that. I think sometimes you go back and watch stuff you've done years ago, and you're like, eh, I would have done that a little bit differently now with the <laughs> knowing what I know now. But man, we're both so freaking proud of that movie. Yeah, and it was certainly challenging. It's like you said, it's just me. And uh, for those that that don't know the gist of it. I'm not going to do a terrible job selling it. (laughs) We meet this man who lives uh, in the middle of nowhere, seemingly something perhaps post-apocalyptic. One day he stumbles upon this dress form in the middle of the woods or or in the lake or something like that. Like literally something a seamstress would use to make a dress. And so he being the scavenger he is, he brings it home and he, uh, he starts to lose it a little bit and he starts to talk to it. And we realize that he's having a conversation with this dress form like it is someone he has had a past relationship with. And we start to learn about perhaps how he ended up there and, and, and what was going on in his life. And, uh, and then I don't want to spell the ending because I think it's really interesting if you do happen to find it. And uh, yeah, so that was really, really interesting. I think one of the, one of the keys to, uh, to the success there for, at least from an acting perspective was uh I sort of insisted we write a script for the dress form. Mm. Um, oh, and, that's a great and idea. It's, it's an inanimate, it's an inanimate object. It doesn't speak. You never hear what they're saying, but I wanted to know, I wanted yeah. to know what that answer was, would be so I could have a, a truthful and honest reaction to their comment. And, and at the, at near the end, it, there is, it was like a four minute scene of us having a conversation and you never hear her side of it, but hopefully you can get the gist of what she's she would be saying based on my reaction. Absolutely. We we watched you have a relationship on screen. Yeah. I mean, sincerely. A hundred percent. Cool. I'm really glad that that translated. Thank you so much for those uh, for those kind words. Did you guys have the entire actual backstory of what this event was? I know you didn't put it on camera for it, but had you decided what is this time and place we're in? What is the full relationship that he's projecting? All yeah, that. Josh and I speculated a lot yeah. about what might have happened <laughs> because one of the things we really loved about this, you, you know, you didn't spoon feed it to us. It's mm. it's sort of open for the audience to speculate as to what really happened and how dark in your own mind, I guess, you want to make this story about this man. And, and so I, I don't want to know, but I, 
I kind of do, like in a weird way too, but don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, don't tell me. <laughs> All right, well, that makes things easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, will, I will just say that I think we had it narrowed down to like two options of what it could be. And I guess the one that I'm not really spoiling is, is I do think that is his, he is projecting his relationship with his past partner onto it. Now, what happened to his partner <laughs> and what he might have done to his partner, <laughs> I think is up for debate, but I would love for other people to, uh, to watch it and have those conversations like you guys did afterwards. That, that was one of those ones where we were like, I want people to leave the theater and one person say, okay, well, it was obviously this. And mm-hmm. the other person go, what? No, it was obviously this. And we wanted to spark a conversation and a debate. And uh, sounds like we did that. Yeah. You guys nailed it. And, and you, you made the character. He was kind of threatening just because you're watching him possibly lose his mind. Or you're just seeing that inner turmoil that he's having and what he's really going through. It's like a guy you don't know if you'd approach. Or you would start mm-hmm. to approach and then you're like, was this a a really terrible idea. <laughs> Do I need to run? But you also, there's there's that feeling, you know, that you bring to it. You like him and you want to know what happened. And I, I just thought that was a really cool balance that you had for that character too. So I think even, you know, I have my favorite theory, but I even argue with myself about it because I'm like, well, but I want, I want him to maybe be okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting that you had those uh, perspectives. There, well, first of all, there was some stuff in there um, that that the the monologue about the um, blueberry patch mm-hmm. um, and sitting on a beehive and everything that actually happened to my mom. What? Oh no! Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm so sorry for your mom. That was fun to to, to bring that into it. But I think at the end of the day, every single character you're ever going to see on screen, there's got to be something. There's got to be just a hint of of likability to them. Mm-hmm. And even if it's just like, if they could be a freaking awful person, but maybe there's something they do that's relatable or you're like, all right, well, that's, or human. There needs to be, that's the better word. There needs to be something to them that's human. And so we are in, in, in Missy, we're seeing someone presumably by themselves fighting to survive, which would make you a pretty cold, resentful person. But I really wanted to bring some, some humanity to him and, and the reality of humanity is that sometimes you're going to laugh and sometimes you're going to cry. So, uh, so try to bring sort of both extremes mm-hmm. to it. Yeah, absolutely nailed it. <laughs> Let's talk about Popular Demand Pictures. It's the the company that you and John uh, are partners in. Because when we did our interview with him, he told us, you know, kind of how you guys got together and all of that. But I'm really curious to talk to you about what that process is that you two have when you decide, all right, we're going to start a new project. Uh, how do you guys build something from the ground up? What's your strategy? It's always evolving. It's always evolving and it's always changing. And I think it's only getting better as we go. So first of all, popular Man pictures is John's company. And then oh. we have a, um, we have a production company together ourselves, 506 films. And that's really just a like semantics thing, but it was worth saying. So our relationship all started, we went to university together. Uh, I think he's a year or two years younger than me. And um, we weren't in the same program at all. And uh, we, were, we were chummy in university. But when I left, it wasn't like we were still in contact. And after he graduated he, with a poli-sci degree, he got, a, he got a degree in screenwriting. And so it was a few years later when I was living in LA, he reached out to me and he said, I, I'm in this program or, or, or just finished this program. And I wrote 10 pages of this pilot that I think are interesting. And I wrote them for you because you're the only one I was living in LA at the time. And he was kind of like, I, I know you're doing it. So I would love if you would take a look at it. And I did. And I was like, you know what, that's pretty good. <laughs> and I was at a point in my life where I was starting to, um, weirdly enough, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the trailer park boys. Um, yes. The, uh, yep. Show here in, yeah, in Canada and North America. I weirdly had, be, of all people to get advice from, I, uh, I went to go see them do a live show at a bar and at a and a afterwards, one of them was saying, you know, in Canada, especially you need to, you, everywhere in North America, as an actor, especially, you need to create your own opportunities because no one's going to hand them to you, especially if you don't look like Romeo or Juliet. And so I had taken that to heart. So John sent me this, this bit of a script and I thought, this is really good. Do you want to write stuff together? Because I want to start doing it more. And I know you want to direct and I want to act. So let's write stuff together that I will star in and you will direct mm-hmm. and we'll both produce it together. 
And it was kind of like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. So we started making stuff, and uh, he lives in Nova Scotia. And I, at the time, was living in Los Angeles and, and now live in Toronto. So when we first started, it was like Skype. We were literally using Skype uh, before FaceTime and all that stuff was around. And we would just shoot the, shoot the breeze and, and try and come up with a nugget. And then it would change. We've, we've done it so many different ways. Uh, I think we started with like, well, let's, let's divide and conquer. Let's figure out the gist of what we want it to be. I'll do it. And then we'll divide scenes. And then, and then we'll go and write them and bring them back. And that's what we have. And then that evolved to like, I'll write a scene and I'll give it to you. And you rewrite a scene. And then you give it back to me and I'll make some tweaks to finalize it, which I think is how the Coen brothers do it now. And, uh, and that has even evolved to like, let me do the whole thing. And then, and then, <laughs> and then yeah, let me get like other eyes on it and, and, and you take a pass at it if you want. So I, I think the last thing we did, we're now at a point where we gotta, we, we've realized we've got to be in the same room to, to, to like, be, we call it beating it out. Like what are the beats of the film or of the, the series or of the short film or whatever it is. And we put them on little cue cards up on a wall, break it down into acts. And then when that's all done, we sort of go like, all right, well, I, I think I could crush that scene. So why don't I take that? And he says, well, I think I could crush this scene. Why don't I take that? And we tried to, we tried to like keep that consistent with a character. So if that scene, I think I really could nail has Jim Smith in it, then I'll take all of Jim Smith scenes. And, and then, so I guess all of that to say now it's sort of a, a mix of everything we beat it out, and then we, we take the scenes that we think uh, speak to us, we write them out, and then we send it to the other person. What do you think? Any builds, anything you could edit and make stronger, make funnier, add tension, and then, uh, and then the final product sort of comes from there. That was a, that was a mouthful. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, no, wait. The only thing I, and this is not a criticism, but when John tells the story, it's much more romantic. <laughs> but when you when you were explaining that you guys had to get together to beat it out, it's like there's the eroticism. There it is. On board. That's the there eroticism we're yeah. looking for. Not be in the same room to beat it out. <laughs> <laughs> I've said it once. I've said it. Once. <laughs> so it, be, because you're <laughs> it's so easy to beat it out when you're in the same room. Yeah. You, when you, when you can make eye contact with the other oh, I person. I like that we're really leaning into and... this. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to have pretty. It, do you have to have very strong characters in mind to do that? Or do you find, oh, when I read John stuff, the character comes off a little more like this. So maybe when we mash it together and write, I'll even them out. Like he's, he writes this character funnier than I had written him. So let's make this guy funnier. Hmm, that's a great question. I think it can be different. I think um, we both definitely have strengths. And I, so there are times where I know like, he can really bring, I think this person would have like a poetic tone um, and be very eloquent and, uh, or, or, or alternatively be very staccato and, and, and humorous. And so it's like, okay, well you tackle that. And then, yeah, I guess there are times where I'm like, listen, I think this person seems like the, the buffoon of the, of the series. So why don't I take that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess we divide and conquer that way. And then, yeah. and then in terms of uh, how, how we sort of, conceptualize the characters i think it's different i think uh sometimes it's uh something unique about that person and that's sort of your launching point whether it be a, a trait or a tick or something like that but more often than not it's the the backstory like what do we think this what, what has this person's journey been how would they think in each scene is there a genre that you prefer and does that change depending on what kind of role you're fulfilling or as you go between roles of you know writing or directing or acting it's different for writing and acting. Writing comedy is one of the hardest things I've ever <laughs> yeah. done, done and attempted to do in my life. Because it's one thing to, to just sort of, it's one thing to be a funny person. It's another thing to put it on paper. Hmm. And so often the things that aren't funny don't translate onto paper. So I, I definitely, I think I prefer, I guess I would call it like dramedy. That would probably, to write, that would probably be my favorite. Like, like life. Sometimes there are scenes that are so slapstick and so ridiculous. And I think last year I wrote a scene that was all about these two guys meeting at a bar and one of them was there first 
at, at, they were meeting at a booth and one of them was there first and then the other one came and sat on the st- in the same side of the booth as them and the whole scene <laughs> I'm like what the hell are you doing you don't sit on the same side of, like um but from an from an acting perspective i think i love comedy mm-hmm. i just love doing comedy i love the like the beats and the timing and and i just find all that i find the science of com of performing comedy so interesting even when i'm watching stand up but uh, there are times where I find myself going like, okay, there's the setup and one, 1,000, two, 1,000. <laughs> you know that they got that timing just right. You can't teach timing, man. You can't do it. No, you cannot. You can break it down, but you can't teach it. Yeah. <laughs> this is awful. But I, I, I was telling you guys earlier, I have a, a young, a young child and, and every once in a while you find yourself just like rambling to them. <laughs> and the other day I was, I was, uh, I was like, you know, you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the prettiest, but if you're funny, it's going to go a long way. Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Very true. Probably farther than either one. <laughs> <laughs> now, as an actor who is writing for himself to act, do you ever have just a man? I have this idea for a character. I want to play this kind of character. We haven't written anything for it. I'm going to just write something for this character I haven't played yet and build a story that way. No, we haven't done that. I haven't done that, but there are definitely times where I think because John and I have been working together for so long, we have a, have a trust. And so there are definitely times where we're writing for a character that I'm going to play and maybe a line is falling flat on, uh, on the script. And, and I can just, I just say to John, like, uh, listen, man, it's going to be fine. I know, I know how to deliver that. I know how mm. that's supposed to come across. Or, or, or alternatively, I'll, I'll, uh, there might be a scene where I'm like, I'm just visually, I don't know how it's going to come together. Uh, and he's like, just trust me, mm-hmm. I got it. Uh, it's going to look great, and and it always is. So, yeah. Do, is there a like a character type or an archetype that you haven't played that you just really like the opportunity to? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I would love to be, I don't know how this is going to sound, but I'm a big guy. I'm like 6'4", and I'm, uh, to say I'm rotund is putting it lately. And uh, and so I think, you know, there's there's definitely a part of me that would like to be the um, love interest, I guess, in something, the, the, the Romeo, for lack of a better word, because I think there's a, you know, we don't all look like a Kardashian, or we don't all look perfect and uh we all deserve love so i think that's something i would like to portray on screen someday i yeah i hope you do it i think that's amazing i okay so i'm always explaining to my single guy friends like women don't give a shit (laughs) what you look like if you're funny and charming and nice we're like yeah we're all in i mean maybe there are exceptions to that but in general that's what's important to us and i think it's cool to just you know to not pander to what we're used to seeing all the time yeah 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 i'll uh there was a movie i saw a long time ago the guy oh my god this is gonna be a lot of like you know the guy who does this thing Uh, did you you guys ever see varsity blues yeah a long time ago so you know the big guy in that movie yeah. uh, who plays the offensive lineman? I don't remember the name of the movie, but I, I there was a movie where he had a uh, he was like making out with Kate Hudson, and and I remember seeing that and I was like, they'll let you do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I'm never gonna remember the name <laughs> no, of it, but, but I remember <laughs> the scene. Yeah, yeah. I just remember. I remember thinking like oh, that's groundbreaking. And then I was like, what? No, that's not groundbreaking. But that is the first time I think I've ever seen a plus-size person uh, have someone take interest in them Mm. in a movie. (laughs) Now, you you recently wrapped up season two of Pub Crawl, which is a show that uh, that we don't get here in the States. But John, when we interviewed him, he was kind enough to send us the first season so we could watch it. I've uh, got the hookups, huh? Send yeah. you guys over. Right? Know, it, and it's so good. I feel like I robbed you guys, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it was, I mean, you heard us talking to John about just, we are genuinely big fans of, of mm-hmm. you and your work. You are so talented in everything we've seen you in. You, everything, you can do everything. Uh, thank you so much. That means so much. I'm going to admit my hands have been sweaty the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and 
with pub crawl you uh, my passion is hosting i love hosting uh which is why we do this podcast why i love doing these interviews and so seeing someone as talented you who can also host i'm like damn it he can do everything (laughs) um uh and it just you you are so wonderful like you're so like laid back and charming um can you tell us (laughs) uh i I just uh, can you tell us about how uh pub crawl came to be uh how it got the season two like how is it making this awesome web series it's 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 like the it's a dream job it's the best (laughs) gig in the world the the log line is um it's it's a it's an unscripted show and it's set in halifax nova scotia which obviously has so much history to it and there are so many bars there that that have so much history to them and so the gist of it is me rob ramsey as as the host of the show being myself drinking my way through the most historically significant <laughs> bar restaurants in Halifax, so which great. is like, it doesn't get any better than that. I love chatting with people. I love history and I love knocking back a bunch of beers. So it, it just, it all made sense. I don't remember exactly how the, the nugget of the idea started, but um, I remember John and I sitting in a bar in, in Halifax many, many years ago. And there was a lull in the conversation and one of us looked up and, and we saw like an old beam and we were like, geez, that's, that's an old looking beam. And then we were like, oh, this place is pretty old. I wonder, I wonder how old it is. And we looked it up and it was something like 260 years old. The, the, bar, the name of the, the bar. And we were like, wow, that's so interesting. How many times do people come into this place and take that history for, for granted? And it, it would be so interesting to explore that history and, and really learn about it and, and uh, do it in a really unpretentious, laid back way. Like let's, let's literally knock back some beers with some people who, who know the history of this place or the people who come to these places now and let's just dive in and learn. And so season one was amazing. We went to six, uh, six different bars and restaurants across the city and learned a ton. One of the most famous bars in Halifax, the Ale House, used to be a uh, Salvation Army where they would send soldiers to dry out and sober up mm-hmm. if they were too drunk. There's also, there's a whole theory of, uh, of a, a system of tunnels running underneath the city. Not a theory, there are, but they're, um, they were also used for rum running because uh, there was, you know, prohibition back mm-hmm. in the day. And there's, there's a big fort uh, just in the middle, just off of, off the of land. And there's a theory that the, there's a tunnel that runs underneath there. And so it was really cool to dive into all those and, and learn about that. And we were fortunate enough to get a season two because there were lots of amazing places to explore in Halifax. And so we just wrapped that like a week ago, two weeks ago. And we got some really, really amazing places. Uh, uh, season one was definitely the like the big spots. If you're going to Halifax, you got to go here. And season two, there's a lot more of like, well, this is where the locals go. Or the, mm-hmm. these might be some places that are off the off the beaten trail uh, that, that still have you know, 150 a year history, which is, which is amazing. Um, so I think uh, that will probably be coming out in spring ish and uh, profuse apologies to those uh, who can't watch it. It's a, it's a bell five one original. So you have to have bell to watch it, which you guys obviously don't have in the States, but it's worth the trip to Canada. <laughs> God, the, we were actually, we were just in Prince George. We had our first trip to Canada. So just completely opposite side of Canada. But we definitely want to come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, and yeah. I think I saw, that, place. I saw that on your Instagram. What did you guys think? It was beautiful. It was so beautiful. Canada. Yeah. I didn't want to leave. I don't know. <laughs> there's just something. You know, when you walk into a place and you're like, "Oh, this feels good." Yeah. It felt yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, totally. I know exactly what you mean. So, do, is there going to be a season three? Do you think? Unknown. Yeah. You never know. Part of that is not up to us. And part of that is uh, doing a deep dive into um, the other other bars and restaurants we could go to. Yeah. So uh, time will tell. Okay. And if there is a, a season three, can we come out and come drinking with you for it? <laughs> I would have it no other way. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, so fun fact, where, where we're from, Davenport, Iowa... We also have a strong bootlegging history, and we also have tunnels running <laughs> all over the, our downtown area and underground. Pubs. So and romantic. Have, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we've got like a ton of breweries and stuff. So if you guys want to do an American edition, come down our neck of the woods. We'll take you out and have a great time. That's the dream. That's, <laughs> that's sort of our big goal for it is to, uh, to keep going out and out mm. and out and out. What if our tunnels connect with your tunnels? Oh, oh, crazy? oh my God. I wouldn't need a passport anymore. I just need a bike. 
<laughs> I know what I thought you were going to say. It wasn't that. <laughs> no. <laughs> So now, uh, hosting and acting are two uh, two very different beasts. Uh, what skills do you find uh, translated from all of your acting training to make you a better host, or has your hosting affected your acting? That's a great question. The, with uh, with uh, so here's the two things I I, I have re- my two big takeaways from hosting. I have been fortunate enough to be the MC at uh, several weddings, several of my, several of my friends' weddings. And one of the one of the things I've learned there is that um, no one's there to see you. You mm-hmm. are irrelevant. So, and I think we've all been to weddings where it's, you, there's an MC who like thinks this is their big shot to get into stand up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's nothing more painful. <laughs> and I think that I, I carried that over to to being a host. People aren't coming to see me. They're coming to see the interesting bars. They're coming to see um, the characters that we're talking to because there are a lot of interesting people we speak with. That's the, that's the meat and potatoes of it. That's the, the sense of community we want to get across. So a lot of it was just knowing when to shut up and when to mm-hmm. get out of the way. Uh, I think that's really important. And then I think there is a like, generally when I'm, when I'm playing a character, you want to try and have a backstory and you want to um, you know, where, know where your character came from and, and, and what their goals are. And, and I think knowing what your goals are as a host is also really, really important. We have someone do a bunch of research on all the places uh, that we go to. And, you know, there's a fine line of like how much I want to read that research and how much I want to learn about that history at the same time the audience does, like in the moment, in the interview. But I do know that like, well, that's a really interesting thing and people are going to love that. So we got to get to that point. There is some finagling of like, well, I know I want to get to this question. That is my goal. So how, as a host, how am I going to get there in a, in a really honest, sincere way? The way you talk about the projects that you've done and the different experiences you've had, it seems like you enjoy them a lot and love them. Is there anything if you had no constraints and you could just do whatever you wanted, you know, no worries about budget or resources, what kind of project would you do? Is there a dream project you have? As, as we've talked about, John and I have been working together for a long time, and uh, he is from New Brunswick, and, and most of my family is from New Brunswick. He now lives in Nova Scotia. Uh, we met at University in Nova Scotia. We are maritimers through and through. And I think there are so many interesting stories in specifically the East Coast of Canada. There's so much history there. There's so many unique people. Like, I think Newfoundlanders are, are always um, mm-hmm. known as, like, the quirky Canadians, but there's so much more to the Maritimes and, and to Newfoundland. And, and I think we have a couple of projects in, in, in the pipe that um, are very Maritime focused and they are telling Maritime stories and celebrating Maritime people. And, uh, and that's, I think, the next thing I'm really passionate about. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> what advice do you have for anybody who is uh, aspiring to be a creator and trying to like break into this field. Do it. Just like, <laughs> like literally do it. Start doing it. You don't need anyone's permission to do it. You don't need, you don't need equipment. You don't need money to go out and, and rent a studio or anything like that. Like we all have a studio in our pocket right now. Uh, <laughs> so there's literally no excuse to do it or ex- no excuse not to do it. And, um, and, and I think one of, the, one of the hardest things to learn is, is the art of storytelling. And I think you only learn that by doing. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I remember hearing a quote a long time ago. Someone said, uh, measure once, cut twice. And I <laughs> always thought that was so... <laughs> <laughs> this goes against everything you're taught. But to me, that just means like, just fucking do it and figure it out later. And it might fail. And it might fail. But, you know, there's always another hardware store around the corner. Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. What interests you right now or what, what do you have going on and what can our listeners sort of keep up with that you're doing? Well, I have a, I have a, a newborn at home, so that's sort of all consuming. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, pub crawl in, in the spring, um, working on a few more things right now. I think I might be shooting a movie in, in the new year, but uh, up in the air, you know, I think a lot of things are just, everyone's just sort of getting their feet un- underneath them again mm-hmm. um, after, um, Post COVID, PC. Yeah. Uh, which I think I said pre COVID. You did? Yeah, PC, PC. They're both, PC. They're both PC. It's it works. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> for a lot of it's going to get confusing for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll worry about that PC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think things are just sort of kicking back up again and I'm uh, excited to, to sh- share stuff when I have it. Awesome. Before we wrap up, where can people follow you? You can follow me on Instagram. <laughs> um, oh God, I'm terrible at social media. Um, <laughs> Real Rob Ramsey. And that's A-Y-R-A-M-S-A-Y. So yeah, that's, um, I'm super bad. I have this like love hate relationship with Instagram where mm-hmm. I, I put stuff up there to promote stuff I'm doing. And then I'm like, Oh, I sound pretentious. So I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like bragging. And, but yeah, that's where uh, most of my updates come from. Nice. I followed you all day for the last day of filming when you were doing all those Instagram stories for the final oh, day of yeah, Call. Yeah. That was a blast. And, I, because, uh, and it was great because I was like, Rob, I've never seen Rob post like anything in his story. <laughs> and then I open it and it's like, there are like 20 slots up there and I was like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was, I, I said to them the day before we did that, I, uh, I think I'm, I'd only posted like two stories. In my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, sometimes I feel like an old man when it comes to social media and I'm just like, man, I have Josh deal with that. I'm yeah, still like tw- Twitter. <laughs> I'm going to cut this. I'll cut yours too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're not old. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode. For CM Alexander and Rob Ramsey, I'm Joshua Khan reminding you, you don't need anyone's permission to do it. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to our interview with Rob Ramsey. We hope you enjoyed it. We had a blast talking to Rob. Please check out his work and give him a follow if you're not already following him. You can find him on Instagram at Real Rob Ramsey, and his last name is spelled R A M S A Y. You can also look at our show notes for additional details on where to find more of Rob's work. Before I let you go, I hope you enjoy this little bit that didn't quite make the episode. Do you want to ask the you? I you know you want to ask the next question. Oh, about Missy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm trying. Thanks for <laughs> you know, I just I, <laughs> I I thought I thought you felt the rhythm, and then you paused, and I just wanted to make sure you got your chance. Yeah, yeah my rhythm is stuttering. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's a more of a staccato rhythm. <laughs> yeah. I'm Joshua Khan reminding you, you've got to be in the same room to beat it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's, oh, wow. No, that's not, that's yeah. not the oh, outro. Okay. I was gonna say that's so I just really wanted to see Rob's face. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, what do I have to give you? <laughs> that's amazing. And for a split second, I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh. Oh, wow. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.